Thank you for standing by and welcome to Evercommerce's third quarter 2024 earnings call. My name is Stacy, and I will be your operator for today. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star one one on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising you your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star one one again. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded today, Tuesday, November 12, 2024. I would now like to turn the conference over to Brad Korch, Senior VP and Head Investor Relations at Evercore. Brad, go ahead. Good afternoon and thank you for joining. Today's call will be led by Eric Reamer, Evercommerce's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Ryan Surek, Evercommerce's Chief Financial Officer. Joining them for the Q&A portion of the call is Evercommerce's President, Matt Feierstein, and Evercommerce's Chief Operating Officer, Evan Berlin. This call is being webcast with a presentation that reviews the key financial and operating results for the three months ended September 30th, 2024. For a link to the live or replay webcast, please visit the Investor Relations section of the Evercommerce website, www.evercommerce.com. The slide presentation and earnings release are also directly available on the site. Please turn to page two of our earnings call presentation while I review our safe harbor statement. Statements made on this call and containing the earnings materials available on our website that are not historical in nature may constitute forward-looking statements. Such statements are based on the current expectations and beliefs of management. Actual results may differ materially from these forward-looking statements due to risks and uncertainties that are described in more detail in our filings with the SEC. We undertake no obligation to publicly update or revise these forward-looking statements, except as required by law. We will also refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures in our comments today. A reconciliation of non-GAAP to GAAP historical measures is provided in both our earnings press release and our earnings call presentation. Before we discuss third quarter results, I would like to once again highlight the presentation of results and KPIs included in the earnings call slides and our prepared comments. As discussed last quarter, we announced the sale of our fitness products, which consisted of four software solutions in early March. The sale of the two North American solutions closed simultaneous with deal signing on March 13th, and the two international solutions closed on July 1st. Our third quarter GAAP results do not include any contributions from the fitness solutions, but GAAP year-over-year comparisons are impacted due to the inclusion of fitness solution revenue in 2023. Performer growth, as defined in our materials and filings, is adjusted to exclude fitness. Operational metrics such as customer count, TPV, and customers enabled for more than one solution that we will discuss today have been adjusted to exclude the fitness solutions on a pro forma basis for comparability purposes. I will now turn our call over to our CEO, Eric Creamer. Please continue. Thank you, Brad. On today's call, I will highlight third quarter 2024 results and trends, as well as provide an update on our transformation optimization initiatives before turning the call over to Ryan to dive deeper into our financial performance. Our third quarter report of revenue exceeded the top end of our guidance range. GAAP revenue increased 0.9% year over year, and on a pro forma basis, which adjusts for the sale of fitness, revenue increased 4.3% year over year. Adjusted EBITDA of $44.5 million beat the top end of the guidance range, representing a 25.3% margin. Adjusted EBITDA margin expanded 140 basis points year over year. Payments revenue, excluding the fitness solutions, grew 6.7% year over year, driven by an 8.4% growth in TPV. Finally, we continue to make good progress against our transformation and optimization goals, including the hiring of a key leader of our EverPro vertical, whom I'll introduce in a moment. EverCommerce provides sound solutions to the service SMB economy. We offer tremendous value to our customers by providing solutions tailored to the unique workflows and interactions that various services require. Our software solutions not only provide the system of action necessary to run their daily business processes, but also the marketing solutions to attract new business, the billing and payment solutions to collect effortlessly, and the customer experience solutions to create predictable and convenient experiences. Our solutions are cost-effective, easy to implement, and purpose-built for the service businesses. We provide end-to-end solutions that are more than 690,000 customers need to compete and grow in a marketplace that is rapidly transforming. On a pro forma basis, we ended the quarter with $679.2 million in LTM revenue, representing a 5.1% year-over-year growth. Subscription and transaction revenue grew 8.6% year-over-year on LTM pro forma basis. 
Also on LPM basis, we generated 24.5% adjusted EBITDA margin, which is approximately 240 basis points of margin expansion year over year. Finally, our annualized TPV expanded to over $12.4 billion, a key driver of payments growth and profitability. We continue to place our highest priority internally on transformation and optimization initiatives. Our transformation efforts are intended to optimize long-term growth and profitability, bring decision-making closer to our customer needs, and invest in key go-to-market opportunities. We continue to make progress since we announced these efforts. First, on the transformation front, we are focused on improvements on EverPro vertical through operational changes to organizational structure, including hiring an exceptional season leader and decentralizing functions such as sales, marketing, and product development to be dedicated to each key vertical. To that end, we are announcing the recent hiring of a strong new leader for EverPro, Josh McCarter. Josh brings 25 years of technology experience to EverCommerce, spanning e-commerce, vertical SaaS, consumer marketplaces, and integrated fintech. Josh serves the CEO of MindBody, the leading technology platform for the fitness, wellness, and beauty industries, where he navigated the company through the COVID-19 pandemic and acquired Wellness Unicorn ClassPass in 2021. Josh also currently serves on the board of Compass. The experience Josh brings the founder, CEO, and board member of startup, pre-IPO, and public SaaS companies will be instrumental in our transformation, capitalizing the market opportunities, and ultimately accelerating growth in our ever-pro vertical. Our parallel initiative of transformation is optimization. With optimization, we identified and execute discrete cost saving initiatives that we expect will provide a runway for long-term margin expansion and free cash flow generation. But in the near term, it will allow for funding of key growth initiatives. Over the last three months, we continue to create and execute operational plans to identify saving opportunities. These initiatives range from the consolidation of third-party vendors and contracts, rationalization of our real estate footprint, optimization of our hosting instances, and consolidation of our PPO partners. Accelerating payment adoption is a high priority at EverCommerce. We often talked about our strategy as landing with our core business management software that upsell and cross-selling our existing customers' additional features, services, and products, leading with payments. As we progress along the transformation journey, particularly with the reorganization of EverPro, this cross-sell upsell motion will transition over time to one that we sell business management software that includes embedded payments. We believe this will further enhance the value our customers receive from the relationship with EverCommerce while also driving additional revenue and margin expansion. At the end of the third quarter, approximately 212,000 customers were able to more than one solution, reflecting 25% year-over-year growth. As we discussed when we introduced this metric, enabling customers for more than one solution is the first step in the funnel that leads to increased revenue, retention, and ultimately profitability of these customers. Once customers are enabled, the next action item for us is to facilitate usage. In the case of payments, this is getting our customers to actively process on our platform. We measure this step in the funnel as utilization. At the end of the third quarter, approximately 88,000 customers were actively utilizing more than one solution reflecting 13% year-over-year growth. Customers that purchase and utilize more than one solution are naturally some of our more profitable, stickiest customers. As a result, the effect of more customers taking payments or other add-on features and services is higher net revenue retention. Looking back over the trailing 12 months, our annualized net revenue retention, or NRR, for a core software payment solutions was 96%. Similar to last quarter, a driver of reduced NRR continues to be the anniversary of a price increase in two of our high-velocity, lower ARPU solutions and not a measurable change in our customer churn dynamics. Year over year, our payments revenue on a pro forma basis grew 6.7%, accounting for approximately 17% of overall revenue. We report our payments revenue on a net basis, and as a result, payments revenue contributes approximately 95% gross margin and is a meaningful contributor to our overall adjusted EBITDA margin. Third quarter estimated annualized total payment volume, or TPV, was approximately $12.4 billion, representing 8.4% year-over-year growth. We continue to invest and actively manage our onboarding programs to accelerate payments adoption, which we believe can accelerate payments revenue growth. Now I'll pass it over to Ryan, who will review our financial results in more detail, as well as provide fourth quarter 2024 guidance. Thanks, Eric. 
Total reported revenue in the third quarter was $176.3 million, up 0.9% from the prior year period. Within total reported revenue, subscription and transaction revenue was $137.6 million, up 3.7% from the prior year period. And marketing technology solutions revenue was $34.4 million, down 6.7% from the prior year period. We manage the business for sustainable organic growth and selectively utilize strategic acquisitions or divestitures to augment the trajectory of this growth. As a result, we believe it is important for investors to also evaluate our growth on a pro forma basis, which is how we measure and manage the business internally. We calculate our pro forma revenue growth as though all acquisitions and divestitures that were completed as of the end of the latest period were closed as of the first day of the prior year period. We believe the pro forma growth rate provides the best insight into the underlying growth dynamics of our business. For Q3 2024, year-over-year pro forma revenue growth was 4.3%, while year-over-year pro forma subscription and transaction revenue growth was 8.3%. The primary difference between actual and pro forma revenue growth rate is attributable to the sale of our fitness solutions. The solid performance in subscription and transaction revenue was largely due to continued execution of our growth strategy to provide customers our core system of action software solutions and driving expansion by promoting cross-sell and upsell opportunities, leading with payments. Our marketing technology solutions revenue was below our internal expectations. While we are likely to end the fiscal year with year-over-year declines in this revenue line versus our expectation for approximately flat revenue at the beginning of the year, outperformance in other high margin areas of the business have made up the difference. As Eric noted, we also exceeded the top end of our adjusted EBITDA guidance range. Third quarter adjusted EBITDA was 44.5 million, representing a 25.3% margin versus 23.9% in Q3 2023, which is 6.5% growth year over year. While revenue mix and to a lesser extent cost savings initiatives had a positive impact on margins during the quarter, They were also aided by the timing of certain transformation investments that we now expect to occur in the fourth quarter. Adjusted gross profit was 117 million, representing an adjusted gross margin of 66.4% versus 64.8% in Q3 2023. Adjusted gross profit improved largely as a result of a positive mix shift in the business. As a percentage of revenue, payments and rebate revenue, both of which have 95% plus gross margin profiles, grew compared to the decline in marketing technology, which carries a lower gross margin profile. Now, turning to adjusted operating expenses, which are reconciled in the appendix to this presentation, overall adjusted operating expenses modestly increased from 40.9% to 41.1% for the quarter on a year-over-year basis, while improving on an LTM basis from 43.5% to 41.9%, representing our approach to balance the amount and timing of investments made in our solutions. We maintain our focus on improvement in customer satisfaction and acquisition, while also highly focused on cost discipline in the functional support areas. Now, turning to some key liquidity measures, we continue to generate significant free cash flow as we invest to grow our business. Cash flow from operations for the quarter was $27.5 million as compared to $27.4 million in Q3 2023. Levered free cash flow was $23 million in the quarter, and for the trailing 12-month period, we generated more than $80 million in levered free cash flow. Adjusted unlevered free cash flow was $35.5 million in the quarter and $125.1 million for the last 12 months, representing 13.2% and 15.9% year-over-year growth, respectively. We ended the quarter with $102 million in cash and cash equivalents, and we maintain $190 million of undrawn capacity on our revolver. We have $533.5 million of debt outstanding as of the end of the quarter, which matures in July 2028. Our total net leverage, as calculated for our credit facility, at the end of the quarter was approximately 2.5 times, consistent with our financial policy. During the quarter, we executed another interest rate swap for a notional amount of $125 million at a fixed rate of 3.395% with an expiration date of October 31st, 2027, as we continue to proactively manage our interest rate exposure. Together with our previous two swaps, we now have $425 million of notional swaps 
at a weighted average rate of 3.91% for the floating rate component of our interest cost. We continue to view strong free cash flow generation as a key priority for the company. With it, we are able to invest in our growing business while also allowing us to efficiently allocate capital across a spectrum of opportunities, including the outstanding buyback authorization and M&A prospects. In the third quarter, we repurchased approximately 1.4 million shares for $14.6 million at an average price of $10.77 per share. Based on the board's increased authorization that was mentioned last quarter, as of September 30th, 2024, we had approximately $39.4 million remaining in our repurchased authorization that runs through year-end 2025. I would now like to finish by discussing our outlook for the fourth quarter. For the fourth quarter of 2024, we expect total revenue of 168 to 172 million, and we expect adjusted EBITDA of 43 to 46 million. Our full year guidance remains unchanged at the midpoint with the given fourth quarter ranges. As a reminder, please note that the full year guidance given previously excluded the sole fitness assets. Operator, we are now ready to take the first question. Thank you. At this time, we will conduct the question and answer session. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Our first question comes from Matt Hedberg with RBC. Matt, go ahead with your question. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for the time. Uh, two questions for you, maybe. Um, the first one, Eric, you know, it, it really does seem like the cross-sell opportunity now is, is significant, especially when you're thinking about higher wallet share. You know, can you talk about, you know, some specific initiatives that the company's doing from like a, a you know, a go-to-market or a marketing perspective that, that could yield even, even better cross-sell, uh, you know, optimization as we look forward? Yeah, thanks, Matt. It, it, it's a great question. I'll, I'll give a high level. I'll let, you know, Matt and Evan kind of take some of the details. You know, one of the, one of the things that we are um, really excited about, and we touched upon this during our last call, is something that we call EDGE. You know, EDGE is a, is a program that we utilized from, a, a previous uh, one of the solutions we currently own that provides kind of rewards and benefits to some of our, our, our some of our customers, specifically in the contracting space. Uh, we launched this into one of our solutions, had really really positive kind of penetration, and now we've since launched it into a couple other solutions, and we're seeing uh, significant uptake from that. I'll let Evan talk more detail about that. Yeah, Matt, it's a great question. So one thing I'd say just on the execution front, we've really uh, focused on integrated sales motion when we think about core systems of action with integrated payments, with reputation management, and edge solution, as Eric said, where we have one team focused on selling that, uh, all of those integrated solutions at the point of sale. Uh, we've rolled that out in multiple uh, parts of our business, both in EverPro and in EverHealth, uh, and really started to see quarter on quarter uh, in, in Q3, uh, significant growth in new payments attached uh, new customer attached to payments for for uh, our new customers, uh, and we'll continue to execute that in in this quarter and into 2025. Um, and Edge is a key component to that, as is uh, as a, a payment and our uh, a reputation management solutions. That, that that's great answer. I mean, it actually kind of dovetailed into the second question. You sort of because it really felt like me payments was, or excuse me, just the, it will cross sell in general, but payments has always been a key catalyst. And I think you know. This year is obviously a bit of a transition year uh, from from a business perspective, and I guess you know when we think to 2025, you know more so on an organic kind of pro forma basis, uh, you know, are, are, you know how would you sort of then rank the most important catalyst for organic reacceleration? Obviously, cross is a big part of that, but is there a way to kind of think about like some some guardrails on on 25 kind of organic growth and and the potential for reacceleration? You know, we're thanks, Matt, for the question. We're not we're not giving guidance at this point to 25, but but I will say that we are all the investments and a lot of that we talked about the transformation optimization we've done through 24. We believe sets us up for um, a reacceleration more towards the back half of of 25 and into 26. I think the the things to answer your question specifically, we are still going after massive markets. You know, we have 
approximately 700,000 customers, and that is a, a very small portion of the markets we're going after. So, you know, it starts with, you know, everything we do starts the top of the funnel. We have to execute more effectively, bringing in new customers in all of our solutions, which, as Evan just touched upon, you saw we started to see some additional pickup in that. And then secondly, what we've, we've, we've done as integrated our organizations, and we talk about getting more vertical, the sales flow from bringing on the new customer to getting the attach on whether that's payments or other solutions, if we do it up front on the sale, which we've now integrated the sales process, the chances of that, that, that customer taking more than one solution and utilizing more than one solution is significantly higher. So you put a lot of effort into that. The third thing, thing I'll say is, you know, we will continue to go back to the, the, one of the biggest opportunities as you're looking at A and B is still to penetrate further in the payment opportunity. We have a massive, uh, you know, we see the amount of payments that run through our system through the invoices that, that are sent out. We, we're getting a fraction of that of that wallet share at this point. And so we have spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort uh, reorganizing our, our go-to-market with payments, reorganizing how we're selling that, and reorganize the team as a whole. And we're super excited about starting to see those those start to pull through. Any out of that, Matt? No, I, I, I think you nailed it. To, to Eric's point, Matt, it, it starts with our system of action software. They're in they're 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 really good softwares in really strong markets. And nailing our go-to-market all the way through new customer acquisition, further embedding additional solutions, um, and, and again ensuring that our customers have, you know, everything that they need to continue to grow with us. That 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 is the driver. That has been the driver, and that will be the driver as we go forward in the future to organic growth. Great guys, comprehensive answer. Thanks. Best of luck. Thanks, our next, Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian McWilliams with Barclays. Ryan, go ahead with your question. Hey guys, this is Damon Coggin off Ryan Williams. Thanks for the question. Just curious if there are any changes in the broader SMB purchasing environment that you'd call out in 3Q and how did linearity look throughout the quarter? Can, can you repeat the last question? Just, just a question on linearity throughout the quarter. If there are any changes you call out? I'll take the, the first piece, um, you know, really no changes quarter on quarter. You know, we've talked about, um, you know, continued ASP expansion, which, which we did a nice job of uh, new customer acquisition in the quarter. And then from a sales cycle perspective, we continue to see flat to, to even uh, compress sales cycles uh, in our core solutions. Um, so really pleased with the progress there in Q3. Got it. And then maybe a question for Ryan, after acting as the new CFO for two months, are there any strategic changes that you might look to make over the next 12 months, or are there any key metrics or changes to guidance philosophy you're thinking of? No key, no key changes in terms of uh, metrics or things of that nature. Those are things that we really think about as we go into the 2025 um, you know, budget season and guidance that we would give. Um, with regard to focus areas, it's going to continue to be the areas that we have, um, you know, put time and effort into the transformation and optimization that uh, Eric mentioned on the front end, and in the, you know, really the embedded functionality uh, we we referred to previously cross sell upsell, but it's the embedded functionality that we're looking to in the um, in 2025 that is a key focus just because of the opportunity that presents from uh, the margin profile perspective. Guys, right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Our next question comes from DJ Hines with Concordia. DJ, go ahead with your question. Hey guys, thanks for taking the question. Um, so the metric that stood out to me, Eric and Matt, in the quarter was the uh, the nice growth and enablement of customers with more than one product. Can Can you just talk about what's driving that? New initiatives there, you know, strategies to keep the momentum going. Uh, any color there would be helpful. Yeah, I think Evan hit on it in his, um, you know, when he answered his question up front, that thinking about that integrated sales motion, so the integrated go-to-market motion, not that we didn't do it before, but really doubling down our focus on that sales rep, talking about that system of action software, but at the, in, in that same go-to-market motion, speaking about the, those embedded offerings that we have, whether that's payments, whether that's edge, whether that's um, as, as he spoke about some of our customer experience solution, really ensuring that at, through that first touch with that new customer, through that new customer acquisition process, 
so they get the sense of the full breadth of the offering of, of what we can do in any of our solutions, whether it be ever health, ever pro, ever well, et cetera. So that integrated sales motion is, is key. And I think you're starting to see that pull through in, in the way we um, sell up front and, and embed solutions along the way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then maybe a follow up on the ever pro side of the business. First, congrats to you guys uh, and Josh for getting him uh, on board with the team. Sounds like a great hire. Uh, the question, have the consolidation of the trades uh, that we're seeing in the space, obviously it's largely been private equity led, is that reaching down into your segment of the market? And, and if so, is Evercommerce a net winner or, or, or loser from that trend? Yeah, thanks, DJ. It's a, it's a great question. I, I think, you know, in general, the answer is no. You know, we're, we're, we're playing in the market. We have a lot of smaller contractors, you know, call it, you know, we, we have a lot of solos, you know, up to up to maximum 10 trucks, but mostly in that, you know, one to 10 standpoint. And, and those are not really the, you know, the in the markets that the PE firms are looking to consolidate. For, for right. the most part, those are not the ones that they're consolidating. So we, we are not utilizing our customers um, from that perspective. It's a very large market and you can't consolidate, you know, every one of those because there's just a lot of one-offs. In the areas where we have a little bit bigger in some of our softwares like Service Fusion, um, you know, that's an opportunity for us that we think we benefit. We think we have a really good solution. And when the when the P firms, you know, do buy those, which has really been nominal to this point in terms of any type of uh, attrition, we think we have an offer, we have a product that provides them value across their their portfolios, you know, if it makes sense. And so we haven't seen much of it from that perspective, but I think if that starts coming to our higher end of our customers, I think we're well positioned to take advantage of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jay. Our next question comes from Alex Sklar with Raymond James. Alex, go ahead with your question. Great. Thank you. Um, just want to follow up, um, either Matt or Evan, probably. Just on your commentary on top of funnel growth for for new customers through the, through the third quarter, any any changes through from the first half of the year on that, and then just given some of the organizational changes taking place, how should we think about the potential for you to be kind of more tactical on a solution by solution basis, either in terms of some of your digital marketing efforts or actual rep hiring? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think we had we we stated before. I think we've seen a lot of consistency in Q3. From an acquisition standpoint relative to the consistency we've expressed in, in past calls from a customer acquisition standpoint the demand environment hasn't changed we've been uh, able to successfully continue to execute our go-to-market initiatives as we have expected to and in certain cases beyond that so we were certainly pleased with you know go-to-market new customer acquisition activity in q3 the second part of the question uh can you ask one more time yeah, just the idea that you're you're got some more vertical alignment with some of the organizational changes and, and just being more tactical on funnel growth, um, either on a solution by solution basis or on a micro vertical basis, just uh, more empowering of, of the, the localized leaders. Yeah, I mean, we, we look at the work that we've done from a transformation as a helping us get closer to the customer in those micro verticals, getting more of our functional groups sitting together versus, you know, a matrixed approach where we had, you know, a centralized marketing team, but then, you know, the rest of the go-to-market team sitting in the verticals, putting all of those teams together, we feel really strongly about, and we've actually seen that across Ever Health as we've driven operational consolidation or super excited as we're driving operational consolidation in, in Ever Pro to reap the, the executional benefits of getting more of our resources sitting together closer to the customer and actually driving uh, better conversion in our in our go to market processes. Okay, great. And then uh, I'm not sure who wants to take this next one. Maybe you, Ryan. But just in terms of the spend optimization efforts, six or so months in, you talked about the 250 million of third party costs. Uh, where do you stand today in terms of the visibility on on potential savings and any any biggest near term opportunities to call out? Thanks. Yeah, we've looked at a lot of different areas. We're, we're we've done a lot of work in um, you know, the real estate portfolio consolidation, we're also working a lot with uh, kind of vendor consolidation from a procurement perspective. There's a number of key areas that we're, uh, that we're looking to. We're not disclosing any particular numbers right now from a savings target perspective. As we get into the 2025 budget process, we may have more visibility to provide, but I would say that uh, we have a very strong inventory of areas that we're working on currently and beginning to execute on those in, in relatively quick succession. 
Uh, Alex, I think you can right. see some of that pull through in some of the margin improvements throughout the year as well we've had this year. Great. Thank you all. Stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from Aaron Kimson with Citizens JPM. Great, thanks for the question. Going off of Alex's question a little bit, what inning would you say the company is in with the ongoing business optimization from kind of a go-to-market perspective driving the top line, as well as from an efficiency perspective on the cost side? Is one piece further along than the other, or do you think about them as one and the same? Yeah, yeah thanks, Aaron. That's, it's a great question. You know, I think we're working on on those in parallel, parallel paths, essentially. So when you think about the you know, the the two pieces of the puzzle, we really have broken them up from a transformation, organize the teams, as Matt says, to get the decision makers close to the customer, bring it on great leadership to run EverPro, as we just talked about, Josh, as a really as a as a business unit from that perspective. So it could actually make decisions um, you know, holistically within that EverPro vertical. You know, at the same time while we're doing that, um, we're we're focusing on some of the optimization uh, categories that you know uh, Ryan just discussed, and so uh, you know we our our hope is these things are happening in parallel. We will increase our go to market, increase our top line while we're managing our cost structure. I think we put in some of our um, you know we talked about it in the in the opening that as we go into 25, a lot of those cost savings are going to help us reinvest in the business in the short term to accelerate growth. And so we look at them as they they, they kind of go together because one's going to fuel the other. Yeah, I would just add to that. I think Ryan said it well. We have a strong inventory of opportunity, and I think that exists both from a transformation and the optim optimization side. So I think we, in certain places, started to reap the benefits in both of those areas, but there still exists a strong inventory of opportunity for us to continue to optimize the business on both fronts. And I would think of them as like multiple parallel paths. We're not waiting on one for another. Like we have the go-to-market activities that are going on from an Ever Pro and an Ever Health perspective contemporaneously with the work that we're doing both on transformation and optimization. So we have, you know, basically spun up multiple teams all working kind of in uh, in concert with one another, but um, not waiting on, on any one particular piece. Thanks for that. And then maybe a follow-up for Ryan, given it's your, your first call with CFO. What's the single most important metric you think investors should focus on when assessing EverCommerce over the medium term to long term? I don't know that there's actually one uh, one metric uh, that I could point to specifically. Um, the, the metrics that we that we outline really um, overall in the presentation, uh, I think, are the ones that we find most important as we run the business from a management perspective. I think the pro forma metrics that we provide uh, on the growth rate uh, point of view are are important. Um, we rationalize those obviously for things that uh, we think need to be adjusted uh, on a growth basis. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, looking at the performance of the, the individual revenue line items is, is quite important. We're seeing very strong results from a subscription and transaction point of view, and I would focus on that uh, really as the, the core activities uh, and the core solutions from EverPro and EverHealth. Those, those are uh, very important to us on a long-term basis. And I would add just one more. You know, the metric that we, we introduced, you know, a few quarters ago, which is talking about the amount of customers that have been, you know, signed up to utilize more than one solution, that, that is kind of a precursor to our ability to get them utilizing um, more than one solution. And once that happens, we have a long history of understanding that these customers will spend more and they will be with us longer. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a really good kind of prelude to what we believe is going to happen in the future. Thank you, guys. Thank you. As a, as a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, press star 1 1 again. Our next question comes from Clark Jeffries of Piper Sandler. Clark, go ahead with your question. Hello. Uh, thank you for taking the question. Um, Eric, you made a couple of references to this. I, I wanted to ask around this new, new organizational structure to EverPro. It sounds like the, the changing the structure to make the decision making close to the customer needs is really to overcome the biggest obstacle to additional upselling, which is customer awareness. But I was wondering if there's anything else that's top of mind within the new organizational structure 
Um, do you think it lends to R and D working better or sales and marketing working better, or is it really about, you know, finding signal from noise off of, uh, you know, more than 690,000 customers and, and making sure they're all aware of what you're, what you have available as a portfolio? Thanks, Clark, for the question. Um, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, all of the above. I think the first thing is the, your, your, the last thing you said is yes, you know, obviously more focus in one specific area from a leadership standpoint provides, you know, better understanding of what, what's happening. But we we feel strongly it's not, it's not just the overall signals, it's the things you talked about. So we've actually, uh, historically, we've had a centralized marketing team that has helped all of our verticals and all the solutions, you know, go to market. Uh, within EverPro now, that is a fully focused, vertical focused marketing organization within within the department. Um, similarly with R&D, R&D, although they were kind of at the solution level, it was kind of led from a both individual to back up, up to kind of a central. The R&D resources within EverPro will be EverPro R&D resources and be utilized to the, the needs of that, that organization. And so the focus for Josh, his ability to kind of take those resources, put them where the best opportunities are within that, you know, EverPro vertical and make sure we're maximizing our investments in, uh, in R&D. And so it's, it, it is much more of the kind of former than the latter. Um, and we feel very strongly, and this is direction we're taking across your organization. Perfect. And then just to follow up around NRR, um, could you maybe remind us about the relative headwind related to some of those pricing changes um, is it, like on an adjusted basis, has that troughed and stabilized? And then I think also just the context of what that was historically so that when we think about, you know, the next year or, or maybe an environment where there might be better economic growth tailwinds, what would be the general range that you would consider as normal or, or normal, uh, you know, business expansionary kind of rates from that metric? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take that one to start. I think taking out the, the, as we have and often speak to NRR without marketing technology <laughs> solutions, just given the campaign based nature of, of them versus the recurring standpoint, you know, we had in previous periods been um, looking at 99 to 100 percent net revenue retention in certain quarters, just a, a little beyond that. You know, what, as uh, you heard us speak to and we've spoken to it in past quarters, the anniversary of a really large pricing action that just would not be repeated in two of our lower ARPU solutions. Um, that we, you know, saw the benefit of from a growth standpoint in 2022 and uh, through the end of 2023, we're watching, you know, that that from a non-repetitive standpoint where the anniversary of that happened through the end of 2024. So we measure L uh, NRR and LTM basis, so you actually see the impact over that over a longer period of time. I think we're actually, we, we are starting to see that um, rise again, but those, those so that is the, the core driver of that reduction from the 99 to 100% RR to, you know, that 96, 97% that we've reported the last two quarters. Perfect. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Bill McNamara of Evercore ISI. Bill, go ahead with your question. Hi, this is Bill on for Kirk, and thanks for taking my question. Uh, given interest rate cuts in the political landscape, has your perspective on the M&A and environment changed at all since last quarter? Well, thanks for the question. You know, it, I mean, it really hasn't changed, you know, in several years. I mean, we are always going to be looking for opportunities to maximize the value of the organization, and that can mean, you know, from an M&A um, acquisition or divestiture standpoint. And so, you know, we take all those factors into account as we looked at anything. Um, and if we see something that's going to make sense for us organizationally, again, whether that's from a acquisition or investor standpoint, you know, we will proceed accordingly. Great. And then um, with the decentralization of sales, marketing, and product development, uh, do you see this as requiring uh, an increase in headcount or, or retraining any personnel to hit full productivity? Yeah. I, I, Again, we don't certainly uh, on the second part of your question, uh, not a not not a real issue from a retraining standpoint. Um, and when we look at this from a personnel standpoint, I think there are just looking at on its face. No, not not from an incremental standpoint. There may be places where we have to add personnel where there there weren't they weren't there before. There may be opportunities for um, personnel to, to actually consolidate in certain places. So on a net net basis, we don't 
we don't look at that from a, a, a large required change to headcount. All right. Thank you for taking my question. This concludes the question and answer session. I would now like to turn it back to Eric Reamer for closing remarks. Well, thank you all for participating in the calls today. Uh, we're incredibly excited about the progress we're making in both our transformation optimization programs, as well as the results we share with you today. I want to once again thank the entire EverCommerce team for their hard work and thank all of you for your support. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. This does conclude the program. You may now disconnect.